I guess the greatest struggle, truthfully, is not the language. Mm -hmm. It's the culture. Okay. Because... Welcome to another episode of The Melanated Files. My name is Ranzo, and today we're in Fukuoka, and I'm joined by Tim, right? Tim has been in Japan for over 24 years. 24. 24. 24. This year, right? This year makes 24. Can you introduce yourself to the world? Tell them who you are and why you came to Japan. Sure. My name is Tim, Tim Dickens in Fukuoka. I'm also known as Mr. Tim because I used to do music. I was on television in 2006 and 7, so the Japanese people call me Tim-chan. Tim-chan Tim this. <laughs> okay, so Tim, what brought you to Japan in the beginning? Well, first of all, I was in the United States Air Force. Okay. And I was in the Air Force in Okinawa for 19, from 1985 to 1987. Mm -hmm. Then I left the Air Force and went back to the United States and went to school, went to college and graduate school. And uh, I was a, became a college teacher. Okay. I was a college teacher in the United, in the United States, in Atlanta, Georgia. So why, why did you move back to Japan? Okay, what happened was in 1996, the Atlanta held the Olympics. Mm -hmm. And what happened was I was helping a guy sell t-shirts and there was this moment where a bunch of Japanese people came to buy the t-shirt. Mm -hmm. But they were kind of nervous because they really couldn't speak the English very, very well. Okay. So what happened was I overheard their conversation and I helped them to get the t-shirts that they wanted and I spoke in Japanese again. Okay. And so that was like a long hiatus of not speaking Japanese. And so when I, sp after speaking to them, I realized that, yeah, you know, I want to go back to Japan. So what was it about Japan that piqued your interest that you fell in love with? First of all, it kind of reminded me of the Chinese movies I used to watch on television Saturday with Kung Fu, all the Chinese writings and stuff like that, you know. I went to, when I was in Okinawa, I walked off the base and I saw all these writings. I said, hey, this is like TV, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> I was like, yeah, this is awesome. And also, the second thing is, it's very peaceful. There hardly any violence. Recently, we had a situation where the prime minister was assassinated. Yeah. That's, yeah. that's a sad situation. But overall, gun violence is very, 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 very low here. Mm -hmm. And so this is a very safe place to be. Mm -hmm. So I love the peace and love that I get from people and I give peace and love back to people. So that's the type of person I am. So when you decided to move back to Japan, what route did you take? Okay, that's a good question. First, I came to Japan via the Japanese government. Okay. The Japanese government had a program, was called Monbusho. Ah. Monbusho. I think today they're called Monbuka, but Monbusho at that time, they had a program called the JET program. Mm -hmm. JET, Japan Exchange Teaching Program. Mm -hmm. And it had three categories of three slots. One of them was English teacher. Another one was coordinator of international relations. And the third one was sports exchange advisor. I came in as the uh, assistant language teacher. Okay. And I was in the Zaifu for, for, for three long years. Very nice place to be. Okay, so from that, you moved on to? After finishing Design for High School, I went to what's called Eikaiwa, Kodomo Eikaiwa, mm -hmm. Children's English School. And I went around and did some things for some schools, and I worked with a person. We started a school. Mm -hmm. And then what really, really, I've done a lot of different schools here in Fukuoka, Seinan, private schools. I even opened up my own school okay. called Tim's Kids. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, the special thing about my school, truthfully, very simply, is I, my, I, I work with babies. I, work, I help mothers. Mothers usually come to my school. The mother had a child. Mm -hmm. uh, the baby is six months. So I'm teaching the mother how to do baby massage and baby yoga and a sign language called baby sign. And all of this has nothing to do with English. Mm -hmm. you do, someone once said to me, you should put on your flyer. You do not have to worry about speaking English in this class because they, they get that eventually. But at first, it's all about exercise and movement for, you know, babies and mama can have fun and we have fun with music and everything like that. So yeah. that's pretty much my specialty, my forte. Really, I, I do work with daycares and elementary schools and things like that. But the thing about having the baby massage and baby yoga type of experience is there's no textbook. Okay. You know, parents don't have to buy a textbook. You know, mm -hmm. We can just go with music and flow and energy and creativity that the textbook just can't help us with. Okay. Is that what you're doing now still? Yeah. 
I'm doing a bunch of different things. I work with daycares. I work in, with the Board of Education in elementary schools. And on occasion, I still do the baby yoga and baby massage because babies in the daycare, are very, they're, they're, some of them are not even crawling. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I'm, doing, I'm showing the staff how to do what I do, you know, teach baby massage, baby yoga, and baby sign language. So Okay, okay, cool. That sounds pretty cool, actually. Yeah, it's very uh, unique. Very it is. Unique. I've never heard about it before. It sounds pretty unique, actually. Because usually in Japan, mm -hmm. like, like you got Ichiro, the baseball player. He plays baseball, but that's all he does. Mm -hmm. You know, to, to have one person do all three, what I just mentioned, is very, very, very hard to find. So what would you say is your, was your greatest struggle in Japan? I guess the greatest struggle, truthfully, is not the language. It's the culture. Okay. Because you can learn a i u e o kaki ku ke ko and all these, you know, phon you know, phonetics and things like that, but they don't put the culture in the textbook. Mm. And there's some things about, of course, all cultures, even our culture, that are really not, people don't want to really talk about. Mm -hmm. So they hide that and they keep it secret. So culture is like walking into a glass window. There's mm -hmm. a glass window in front of you, but you can't see it. Mm -hmm. And you can smack right into it. And he's like, nobody told me about this. Yeah. You know, you know one, one sister, she was in the JIT program, too. And she asked me, why, why do Japanese people do such and such? So I explained to her, yeah, the Japan culture is this the way that another. And she said, well, all the, if that's what it's all about, why didn't they just tell me? You know, just tell me, you know, just let a sister know. But the thing is, it's not that clear all yeah. the time. It's unspoken. Yeah, it's unspoken. Mm -hmm. And they don't put it in the textbook. So how, how did you overcome that? Trial and error. Trial and error. You have to hit the window and have to ask the question. Sometimes, for going on 24 years now, sometimes I had to ask the specific question. I had to be taught a technical term, a technical mm -hmm. Japanese term. Mm -hmm. That after I researched it, I realized, ah, this is not in American culture. Okay. Yeah. This is in Japanese culture. This is their culture and of course coming from Brooklyn, New York which is where I'm originally from in the, in the States we may not have all these different cultural differences like the, you know like in Japan mm. but once you learn the culture one step at a time you, you get to go high and relax and you, do, you living here becomes easier you can avoid the glass now <laughs> yeah and also you can help other foreigners, you know, mm -hmm. I have a lot of brothers here, people, you know, they might have stress with their marriage and stuff like that. My, why does my wife do this? Why does my wife do that? And, you know, I share my information with the brother and, uh, and things go better. Things okay. go better. Okay. Yeah. So did you manage to start a family here as well? Yes. Actually, uh, I have three children. Mm -hmm. My oldest boy, he's in the United States Marine Corps, and he was an Army Scout as well. He's finished all that, and he's in the States right now. His mother is American. Okay. okay. Uh, I have two children here. One is, he just turned 18 this week. And okay. also the 15-year-old boy, he'll be 15 next month. And... Those are the only two children that I have here in Japan. My my, my ex-wife, that's what it is now. She, she and I are divorced. Okay. okay? So she, but she's a great, she's a great person. But she, she and I are divorced, and uh, the kids. I see the kids, which is really sometimes a, a story in itself. But the older boy is closer to me. The younger boy is in a situation where he's kind of confused because okay. mama remarried. Oh. And so when she remarried, she married really the quintessential Japanese man. Mm -hmm. So he wanted to change the names. He wanted to change this. He wanted to like rewrite history, you okay. know, which is kind of bad, mm -hmm. honestly. It's kind of the cultural thing, too. You know, nobody wants to talk about the old Japan history because it's not really it's not really positive, to be honest with you. But he's that type. And so I still see my children. I'm very happy about that. Sometimes it's, it's stressful with the younger one, but uh, it takes some getting used to. What are some of the common like beauty and struggle of that sort of relationship dynamic? Me. Intercultural, interracial marriage. Well, it's interesting. The question you ask again, the, the interesting thing is... Uh, what was the beauty of the relationship? I have to be honest with you. This is not very nice to say, perhaps, but I got married because I made my wife pregnant. Okay. We wasn't married. You mm -hmm. know, she just got pregnant. Mm -hmm. You know, so it's what they call in Japanese, deki chata kekkon. Okay, I just got my head right to my head. Yeah. I, you know, I got married, but I had no pressure like to get married, but I just thought I was doing the honorable thing mm -hmm. by marrying this girl because, you know, we had unprotected sex and she got pregnant. 
So the beauty, I didn't have time to find the beauty. I just had, I just had time to find the credit card and how we gonna pay for all this stuff. And I went broke. I was happy. I was unhappy about that. So I was unhappy. I was unhappy camp from the giddy up. Okay. But uh, the, the, the <laughs> I know people are just laughing at this, but I tell the truth here now. Oh, the beautiful thing, if there is a beautiful thing, is the two children. Okay. The beautiful thing is really the two children. My two boys are awesome. They're beautiful. They're great. My oldest boy in Japan here, uh, he's taller than me. Okay. And he's bigger than me. Now, the struggle is, like I said, from the giddy up, it's the culture. Mm. You see a Japanese woman, very simply, let's just say she handles all the bank books and she might give her husband some spending money for the week or for the month, but she handles all the bank books. And that's the culture. You know, I have a financial advisor who says both husband and wife as a team mm -hmm. have to understand what's going on. There should be no secrets about someone got a new credit card and didn't tell the other person. Ah, 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 ah. Mm -hmm. So from my financial advisor's point of view, this is not the way to go. But that's what they do in Japan. But is there a way to like bridge? Was there any attempt to bridge the cultures? Because if it's two cultures, I'm like, well, it seems reasonable that there's a bridge. It's just mm -hmm. communication. The first thing is understanding that your partner, whether you're a woman to a, married to a Japanese man, foreign women, or a foreign man married to a Japanese woman, is that they have culture and they have assumptions mm -hmm. within their culture. You just got to understand the assumptions. And if you understand the assumptions or maybe get counseling sometimes to help you understand the assumptions, then the communication is such and such where, okay, well, you know, I understand about how the woman handles the, the finances in Japan, but I have another idea too. Can I mm -hmm. share with you my idea? Okay. And the, you can have two good ideas. You know, may, there might be two competing ideas, but they are ideas and worth understanding. I think it's really important to understand other people's ideas. Mm. You know, and so then because by doing so, then you better understand your own idea. I think so. So what has your experience been like, mm -hmm. right? Being a black man living in Japan? Well, well, okay. That's the, you know. I would say going down the streets of Fukuoka, girls downtown, they are simply gorgeous. Bars, clubs, wherever they may be. Yo, that's the place where our brother should be. These kids, I, I'll be honest with you, man. I stay for the girls. <laughs> I just tell it straight, you know. But being a black person in Japan is kind of interesting because once upon a time, like when I was out there emceeing in the clubs and everything, I used to have long dreads. Okay. So the fact that I had dreads, everyone thought I was from Jamaica. Mm, I see. I, so I said, no, 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 I'm from Brooklyn. You know, I'm from Brooklyn. Mm -hmm. And I'm from America. So sometimes people get the ideas confused because if you have hair a certain way, they expect you to be like this. Mm. And then when I was first interviewed on television years ago with the dreads, and I had, coincidentally, I had to dress. The guy who interviewed me, mm -hmm. he said, no way, you're not an English teacher. There's no way you could be an English teacher. So he called up the school, mm -hmm. got permission from the school, the high school, the Zypher High School, yeah. came to the Zypher High School and filmed me teaching the kids. I was using hip hop rap style and the kids had to listen to the words and, and write it in. Mm -hmm. They had the sentence, but they had some words missing. Yeah. So it was listen and try to catch the word. And he was trying to catch the word too. And eventually at the end of the show, he says, yeah, he's, this guy is something else. He's going to be something, you know, in Japan. So sure enough, later on, things it's, happened for me. And know? then he went on TV after yeah, television. That. Yeah. And radio too. I used to be on the radio. Okay, yeah, okay. I used, be, I used to be on, I was on radio maybe for four years or longer. So what would you say is your greatest triumph in Japan? I would say the greatest, well, I'm not sure if it's the greatest, but one of the things that went well for me was that in 2006 and then in 2007, I was on television. Okay. I was on television in Japan. And that's where I realized that before then, I was kind of like doing emceeing and rapping in, in, in different places. Mm -hmm. And uh, I had two CDs actually that I put out okay but the thing is instead of entertaining in the club i realized i was a better entertainer for children mm. and i was a children's entertainer so i used all my teaching experience with music and children's classroom music and stuff like that and i put it to the test with my own charisma color and everything 
and I was a great entertainer for children. And so I love children very much. Of course, I love my own children first, first and foremost, but I love everyone else's child, and that's the thing about me. Actually, I used to have an email address uh, called Kodomo Tim. Kodomo mm-hmm. is child. Mm-hmm. Kodomo Tim at Yahoo or Gmail or whatever. I forget what it is. But my nickname is Tim Chan because when I was on television, I used to introduce myself like that. Mina-san, ohai gozaimasu. Tim Chan desu. So that's the greatest triumph to understand. Not so much only being on television, but by reaching children and parents, families' hearts, you know, with positive wow. energy, you know. How did you learn Japanese? Okay, that's a good question. I learned Japanese when I was in Okinawa, when, okay. I was, when I was stationed there in the Air Force. Basically, what happened was after finishing the job, I was a dental assistant. I worked okay. in the hospital. After finishing the job, at the end of the day, the military will allow its members to take classes at night and in the evening. And so they pay even a certain amount of the money of the tuition for the classes. So I took Japanese classes okay. in Okinawa for a period of two years. And I came out with maybe 12 college credits, maybe 15. And so when I went back home to Brooklyn, I tried to get into Brooklyn College. I wasn't sure if I would be able to do that because Brooklyn College is even today very, very prestigious. Okay. Very is. So what happened was they saw the transcripts, uh, the, the credits from the Japanese language, and they said, ah, He's not a freshman entering student. He's a transfer student. So they looked at it that way. So I was like, oh, great. I don't have to take all these hard tests and everything like that. So I just walked into Broken College. Okay, okay. Yes, and I, my, my background at that time was uh, classical languages, what they call classical languages, and Greek and Latin, ancient, okay. ancient Greek and ancient Latin. Language is intrinsically connected to culture. Mm-hmm. It's not one thing to be able to say a word, but there's a culture involved with it. So... It's kind of like you become like a sort of like anthropologist in a way, mm-hmm. in some in some way or another, to be able to uh, unravel what the Japanese people want to say and, and things like that. So, what's one lesson that you've learned, right, living in Japan for mm-hmm. 24 years? I would say, if you're going to live in Japan, try to learn not only the language but be patient with trying to learn the culture. Because, let me say this here, I have a background in this, that, and the other. went to Columbia, Div- Columbia University's Divinity School, Union Theological Seminary. Okay. Okay. And so the thing is, no matter how much schooling you have, there's a lot of things you still don't know, even in your own native language. Okay, so sometimes I have to get the dictionary and say, look, you know, what's this and what's that? So it's the same thing when you're learning a second language or even a third language. You know, there's going to be those things that are not in the dictionary that they don't want you to know necessarily, but you're going to run into it. So Mm -hmm. you have to pace yourself and be patient and try to understand. It's very interesting to be able to fluently speak a language and have stress at work. The stress is because of the culture. Mm. That's why you're having or someone is having distress. And there's something about the culture. And the thing is, you don't know it's a cultural thing that's happening. What do you like about Fukuoka? First of all, Fuku in Japanese means happy. Okay, and also in Japanese, the the word for gospels is Fukuoi or Fukuin. Okay. Okay. So Fuku has that sort of like spiritual connotation of happiness. The, the gospels or the good news, the Fuku, Fuku, Fukuing, Fukuoi, is this is a really happy place. This is a blessed place to be. I mean, there's a lot of blessed places in Japan, I think, mm-hmm. believe, but this has a unique aura to it. Fukuoka is the place to be. I'm glad I came here. Okay. So, so you'll never leave Fukuoka? I hope my mama ain't watching this. But <laughs> my mama wants me to come home. Oh, yeah? Yeah, but, you know, she's mama. And, you know, she, she loves her baby, and I'm her, I'm her first. Okay. And so I can't blame mama for that. But they understand now, going on 24 years, that, you know, probably I'm going to be here for a while. Has she visited Japan before? No. Why no. not? Because here's the thing. Mom smokes, and she can't sit in the airplane for 14 hours without a cigarette. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> That's just the way how it is. Mama needs some t- chewing gum or something. But my daddy, he could come. Is there anything that you want to, want to tell the world? Like people that are watching right now, is there a message that you have that you want to share? I just want to say to everybody, Jesse Jackson, keep hope alive. You know, I'm from that generation. I was born in the 60s. Okay. Okay. So, I, you know, Malcolm X got killed. King got killed. So many others, Mega Evers. So I'm from that world, you know. So just, just keep hope alive, you know. Show love. That's what's most important, I think. 
All right. So, Tim, where can people find you online? Well, I'm on Instagram, something called Bar Stars Fukuoka. And that's my page, my personal page. I use a lot. I use that page for training and things like that. So my YouTube channel is is mentioned in there, too. But I'd like to keep it, you know, with exercise and training and sometimes with teaching. Okay. Guys, thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please give it a big thumbs up. And remember to subscribe to this channel for more videos like this. Until next time, thanks for watching. Bye for now.